Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a miserably warm Florida Friday morning. I mean, it's like 70 plus degrees now. It's early in the morning. It's only going to get hotter. It's going to get hotter during the day. Once again, we've been cheated out of our winter weather, and it just absolutely pisses me off. I mean, it's March. It's early March. I, you know, this should be mornings in the 50s or 60s. It should be afternoons in the 70s. And instead, we're within sight of the 90s. And it's just absolute shit. And frankly, I don't even want to talk about it. So I'm going to go on very quickly from the weather because, you know, I did the photos of this car earlier, and I was already sweating. And it's... It's just unacceptable. But uh, anyway, here I am. Uh, today I've got this 1987 Renault Alliance. It's an L convertible. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a rare car to have today. I mean, back in the day it wasn't, but today it is. Because there just aren't many of these things left. Uh before I get into it, animals have been quiet. You know, there have been some birds around. I'm not that excited. I'm not that worried because they haven't been swooping down, but they're there. Uh, I'm deep into the coronavirus whiskey. I do have my 38 in my pocket, so if anything gets close, and that includes Peter's ridiculous cat, uh, then it's not going to be a pretty thing, and we're going to see where it goes from there. So. Weather aside, I will say there were some deer. I was here yesterday doing photos. I didn't do a video of the car because I had a Toyota Solera, and I would rather chew razor blades and eat broken glass than do a video on a Toyota Solera. But I was here, and there were some deer out there. And I know people keep telling me they're not carnivorous, they don't eat people, but I'm telling you, the, the look in this deer's eye, the glint, the teeth... Uh, I could just see it standing over me with, you know, three or four of its friends eating my innards, having killed me. And uh, I have a feeling that deer are carnivorous and people just aren't noticing or something. We'll see. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, we're going to get directly right into this car. Coronavirus whiskey aside. I probably had a little bit too much this morning. Uh, so we're, uh, we're just going to jump into this Renault. Uh, this is, again, a 1987. This is the last year of these cars. Uh, very, very <sighs> forgotten at this point. But it does have a very interesting story. And uh, we're going to get into that as we go. So uh, here it is. By the late 1970s, uh, the U.S. automakers were in trouble. Uh, with the, the malaise era was in full effect. You know, turn your heat down, turn your air conditioning down, try to live in a way that's not comfortable. That was what, you know, the late 70s was all about. And uh, people were freaking out. So there weren't many new car buyers. There, you know, the country was in a bit of a recession. Everybody was miserable. And uh, the car makers were in trouble. Um, Basically, gas prices were very, very high. Again, you know, you had a gas crunch. Um, AMC was fourth place. Obviously, you know, you had the big three. Then you had AMC. But they were dwindling. And they had dwindled to about 2% of the domestic market. And uh, that's despite the Matador, which I did a great... <laughs> I don't know if it was great, but I did a video on a Matador, so I'll link to that in the bottom. But uh, I've always liked AMC cars for a variety of reasons. Uh, but while Chrysler was able to claim too big to fail status, which got them loan guarantees from the government for a bailout, AMC was... Uh, it, they pondered it and then unceremoniously passed over. So 4% of the U.S., or uh, even less, 2 3% of the U.S. car market wasn't enough. It wasn't too big to fail. Uh, the government decided AMC could go away, and uh, they were in trouble. So given very few options, AMC CEO Gerald Myers... He went with his hand in hand to Europe and eventually found a taker in his this sort of proposal for the 
you know, getting AMC back on its feet. He found a Renault. Renault was cash rich. They were government owned. They were doing okay. And they really desperately wanted an entry into the U.S. market. Uh, well, AMC's money trouble gave them that. So they were sold a basically majority ownership stake in AMC and uh, injected much needed cash into the company so that they could build, you know, they could develop new cars, which is what they, you know, obviously things were going different and the, you know, the, the gas crunch, whatnot, they, everybody needed small cars that were fuel efficient and AMC was no different. So they got the cash from Renault and uh, they, the AMC would benefit from being able to develop new models while uh, Renault, who had been in the U.S. market but not very strongly, would all of a sudden have a great dealer network and a setup to get into the U.S. market for importing more of their cars. So uh, it initially seemed like a sweet deal for both concerns. Uh, so the strength of uh, AMC's government via, you know, the Jeeps, the uh, mail Jeeps, that sort of thing, were very helpful because that gave Renault a base in American operations to immediately keep making money. And at first, everything seemed to work splendidly. The partnership allowed AMC to leapfrog forward in developing uh, a small car, you know, to suit the times because, again, gas prices were absolutely insane and everybody needed to come up with something. Uh, so Renault had been working at that. Pop culture was on a Euro kick at the time and was celebrating everything France uh, for some weird reason or another. So it all seemed to work out. Uh, so they took the European Renault 9 and the Renault 11 and uh, worked them over with five mile an hour bumpers with the interior redesigned by legendary AMC designer Dick Teague. Uh, his counterpart from Renault, Robert Opron, was responsible for the exterior tweaks. You know, you had to take these Euro cars and put five mile an hour bumpers on them, basically. That was all he did. Uh, but while Chevy was struggling to get its subcompact Chevette up to snuff and Ford was refining the Escort, the Alliance was very dialed in right out of the box, uh, largely because Renault had been building small front-wheel drive cars for years, and the platform arrived in the U.S. ready for prime time. Uh, out of the gate, it was a tremendous success. I mean, it was named a Car and Driver's 10 Best List. It was Motor Trend's Car of the Year. Uh, it, you know, all of a sudden, people were wanting Renaults, which is... Frankly, very, very strange. Uh, it was absolutely, the press was charmed. They were charmed by this car, which just seems strange. And sales were brisk right out of the gate. The first year was 1984, so it was released in 83 as an 84 model. And they sold over 200,000 units right away. Uh, in sedan, coupe, and hatchback form. The hatchback was known as the Encore, uh, which frankly is a car that I would have preferred to have over this one, but whatever, you get what you get. Uh, Renault was louding itself as the one to watch. <laughs> you can see it on TV. People seem to really like that idea. And, uh, you know, looking at this car now, even with this fancy convertible form, it seems a bit unreal to me because it's such an incredibly vanilla car. I mean, it's really, really boring when you start to look at it. Uh, but in 83 and 84, it seemed to be, you know, I think it's probably because the domestic automakers were making some really... Frankly, very shit vehicles at that time. So, you know, this car kind of seemed to be out of nowhere and pretty well manufactured. So sales were brisk. Uh, it was a small car with great miles per gallon, uh, an immediate reputation for a good build quality, which would fall apart later. But out of the box, people thought it was well built. Uh, and it was just the prescription for where the world was at the moment. I mean, you had these really high gas prices, absolutely ridiculous. So people all of a sudden wanted small cars. And boom, there's Renault, there's AMC uh, with this car. So it actually worked out straight out of the box. Uh, they sold more than 
thousand units in 1984 and turned AMC profitable after a decade of you know turning in losses. So uh, it all seemed to be working very well. I mean, it seems a bit unreal now looking at this vanilla tired. You know, and this is a convertible. I mean, in 83, 84, it was only sedans and the coupe that Dick T came up with, but we'll get into that. Uh, but, um, you know, how did they do it? <laughs> it just seemed to absolutely suit the time. You know, back in 83, 84, you're talking about a car that was front-wheel drive, four-wheel independent suspension, had a fuel-injected four-cylinder while most of its competitors had carbs, uh, front disc, rear drum, you know, decent sized wheelbase, well-designed interior, because again, Dick Teague was something of a uh, maestro, and you know, people just immediately liked the car. Immediately was thought of as having a high build quality, which it frankly didn't, but when it was right out of the gate, people thought it did. You know, the trunk closed with a Mercedes-style thud, so did the doors. Uh, you know, everything seemed fine. And uh, it just seemed to be working very, very well. So again, 200,000 sold. Uh, you know, everything offered at a low sticker price, even lower than Toyota's, uh, you know, which were, say, the competitors were kind of shit at the time. You had uh, the Toyota Corolla, which was a good car, but it was carbureted and it was kind of old feeling, while this Renault was fuel injected and it seemed more modern and it seemed more European. So it worked out well for it. Uh, you know, if the car had had better competitors, it wouldn't have come out of the gate so well. But people ran out, they started started buying it. There were good sales figures in 1984, good sales figures in 85. AMC is all of a sudden turning a profit. And uh, everybody thought it was going to work out great. But uh, the honeymoon just wouldn't last. Um, even though sales were decent in 85, by 86 they were absolute shit. Everything had taken a turn for the worst. Uh, for one thing, gas prices went way, way down. Uh, they went from being way, way up to way, way down. And all of a sudden, Americans started gravitating back towards bigger cars. And that certainly didn't help this one. But basically, the honeymoon wouldn't last. Uh, the high build quality that people thought was there wasn't. After a year or so, the cars started to sort of fall apart. Uh, you had overheating issues, you had trim pieces falling off. Uh, you know, in very short order, the car went from being this sort of, wow, look at this great high quality Franco-American European import uh, to, oh my God, this car is an absolute piece of shit. And it happened in record time. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that was interesting about this car is you, it used Renault's knowledge of little front wheel drive cars. Uh, with AMC's hookup, they went to a old Nash factory in Renault, uh, sorry, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Renault invested money to modernize the factory, and they started building the alliances there. Well, it ended up that more than 72% of the cars were made in the uh, United States. So it was essentially classified as a domestic car, uh, which it was all the way through its production, including this one. So this Renault no, this obvious French import is actually a domestic car. I mean, when, you know, Car and Driver made a big apology for naming this one of their 10 best cars. 26 years after they did it, they made an article that said, hey, you know, for 26 years we've been suffering under this. We're so sorry that we named this a 10 best car. But here's why we did it. And one of the reasons was in 83, uh, you know, they were provided all the new cars by the manufacturers and most of them were absolutely shit. Uh, the best of the bunch was a Pontiac Sunbird. I mean, imagine that, a uh, Cavalier sort of a variation and you know it came in a very close second place but you're talking about the Dodge 600 ES when everybody was tired of the K car platform uh, you're talking about the Pontiac Sunbird the Oldsmobile Forenza you know again uh, Cavalier clones if it had been thought of as a European car it would have been up against the Mazda 626 uh, you know the Porsche 944 uh, it definitely would have not been car of the year, but as a domestic, 
there just wasn't that much for it to compete with and it ended up doing very very well um, probably the best of the alliance can be traced to Dick Teague I mean you've got this Franco American collaboration you've got um, uh, the French guy, Opran, he made the outside, but, you know, he didn't make it that exciting. You've got Dick Teague, he made the inside, and he also decided that it could be a coupe, uh, which uh, it wasn't in Europe. So he designed the coupe, they decided to make it. I think it actually looks pretty cool. In 85, he decided to make it a convertible, so he hired American Sunroof Corporation. They always come into these videos, and they strengthened the windshield frame you can see it looks like a you know Hummer there they really had to strengthen it uh, they sort of beefed up the suspension and whatnot and turned it into a convertible so you have to give credit to Dick Teague for trying to make a car out of it but otherwise you're just talking about you're talking about a you know they made the worst of both worlds because French cars generally are not boring and somehow this one is so it's like you know you took the French you took the Americans you got them together and they picked the worst of both so you had French styling which ended up being kind of boring and then you had American engineering which ended up being fairly low quality at least on the production floor and uh, finally after all of that even though it came out of the gate very well uh, you ended up with a car that was kind of junk so it's kind of a shame I'm gonna pause there for a minute I get my shit together uh, then we're gonna get into the exterior styling of this car and then we're gonna look inside look in the trunk and go for a drive so uh, bear with me one moment. Uh, looking at this car, you've got 87 only headlights. The earlier cars had four squares up front, which frankly I preferred. I think I liked that better. I mean, it was at least one distinguishing feature on an otherwise incredibly vanilla car. Uh, this has one square headlight with a parking light next to it. Uh, you've got a three row grille. You've got that five mile an hour bumper. I found a Renault license plate for it. Uh, you've got that lower air dam, which looks pretty good. And I doubt any of the cheaper cars had it. Uh, you've got these ludicrous wire wheel covers, which I despise. Uh, it actually has pretty good looking styled steel wheels behind it, which I I almost would have used but they you know they just had the wheel covers put on too many times so there were scratches everywhere and I don't know it just doesn't look what I did <laughs> The car is just a little bit boring. Uh, and you know, French cars, as a rule, are not boring. I mean, these things, they can be ugly, they can be strange, but they're almost never boring. It's like they took the worst of France and the worst of America in terms of build quality, put them together and made the alliance, and that's where we ended up. Uh, you can see the rather beefy windshield frame. That was done to strengthen it up by ASC, American Sunroof Corporation, which is now uh, American Specialty Corporation or some such. But anyway, back then they were responsible for most of the factory convertibles and uh, still are uh, you know people thought this was kind of cute but it really didn't help sales even though you see the chrome door handles are kind of flush they look nice uh, it's got a very standard style vinyl tonneau cover over the top you've got that five mile an hour bumper which integrates fairly well uh, you've got the alliance name which I'm sure refers to the alliance between AMC and Renault uh, you know when they pull tested the name Renault actually pull tested better uh, so they did they, they could have named it an AMC but that was and in the end they relegated that to a little sticker on the back window and that's the only place you saw AMC on the car uh, so apparently in the early in the 80s, Renault was desirable. I can't see that now, but apparently so. You've got impact strips down the side. You've got the Alliance L. I don't know if that stands for luxury, and I'm not sure I care. Uh, you've got black mirrors on the side, sort of wing mirrors. You know, there's not much you can say about the styling of this car. I mean, particularly when you're getting into, like, sedan form, uh, it's basically just a car. I mean, it's just transportation. There's nothing terribly special about it. I guess this one being a convertible does add that. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, forget it. So, anyway, let's have a look inside the trunk. We're just going to get this thing over with. <laughs> 
really are. I'm just, I'm telling you, the whiskey is more exciting to me right now than the car is. All right, so obviously this key isn't working. That's not the right key. Let's try another one. I don't think it's that one. I think it's this one. I don't know why this car has seven keys or why they're in any way different. There's just no reason for it. Anyway, there is the trunk. When I bought this thing, I got it at Mecham a while back. You know, it's always exciting when you find ECUs in the trunk. That just makes me feel very chipper. But, um, you know, for the moment it seems to be working, so I'll keep my fingers crossed. Uh, because it's convertible, you had this little drop-down thing added there to accommodate the top. Otherwise, these cars were considered as having pretty good trunks. And I have to agree with that because it's a subcompact car. Uh, you take that drop-down to hold the top away and all of a sudden you've got a pretty nice big trunk. It does have a high threshold, which, um, you know, there were some complaints about at the time because you had to put cargo over the top of that. But otherwise, the trunk was a pretty nice size and part of what made these cars desirable, at least in the earlier years. And the, you know, fit and finish is pretty decent. You've got the vinyl there, you've got the carpet there. You know, it all looks pretty good and uh, you'll be able to get some shit in there if you need to. Underneath here, in a place I'm sure Dalton didn't bother to even try to clean, is gonna be your spare tire. Yeah, there you can see it, everything looking pretty normal there. And, uh, you know, very properly European, so. Let's have a look under the hood. Oh boy, it's almost sob-like, except it doesn't slide forward, but the hood tilts forward. It's got that nice little retainer thing and a prop rod, and uh, the uh, hood insulation is still there. But here is a single overhead cam, 1.7 liter. Now in the earlier days, in 83, 84, when this car came out, it had a 1.4 liter, putting out about 60 horsepower, incredibly anemic. Uh, basically the zero to 60 time and the quarter mile time were about the same. I mean, I think it went through the quarter mile traps at like 68 miles an hour or something. It's absolutely ridiculous. Just not a very powerful car, particularly when made it to the sort of anemic three-speed automatic. Now with the five-speed, it would turn in pretty decent gas mileage. It would turn in pretty decent, I won't say decent acceleration, but adequate acceleration and uh, would, you know, be good enough to get your average commuter where he needed to be. And that's probably why they ended up selling enough of them. This thing, you're talking about, uh, you know, you've got air conditioning draining horsepower. You've got the automatic draining horsepower. It's just not going to end up being an exciting setup. But, uh, you know, at the time, again, Renault had been building small cars. American manufacturers weren't really used to them. They were still dialing them in. So all of a sudden, this thing looked pretty good to people. I mean, you had McPherson struts up front. Uh, you had a very fancy sort of trailing arm independent suspension in the back. So you got four-wheel independent suspension. You've got uh, discs up front, drums in the back. Uh, you know, automatic or five speed. Uh, the wheelbase was stretched out, so the interior was actually quite large and nice, which uh, again contrasted well with its competition. And uh, people were initially enamored, and that's before everything went to absolute shit. So uh, the 1.4 liter went on to become a 1.7, as in this car, uh, which helped it because, you know, again, a few more horsepower, a few more torques, a little bit of pep. Uh, there was a GTA version, which is hilarious because, of course, that mimicked the Pontiac Firebird Trans Am at the time but truly was supposed to hearken to the Renault Alpine GTA, which was a significantly more exciting car than this one. Uh, but they did have it. That had a two liter in it uh, with a five speed, a little more pep. And again, car magazines at the time found it kind of appealing. Uh, they said it was a bargain pocket rocket. Uh, today, I don't know if they'd stand by those words, but back then they did. Uh, so look, mechanically, the car was actually pretty well set up. Uh, you know, it was something that Renault had tweaked in. Uh, they had the time to do it while, you know, Chevy, Ford, whatnot, uh, they were still trying to get their uh, Chevette styled in, their Escort 
escort styled in. Um, you know, the rabbit, uh, they, it, this basically followed the rabbit. The Germans decided to take their golf, call it the rabbit, and make it in the United States, and they did so. This was the second car to sort of follow that same formula. Uh, arguably, AMC, Dick Teague, and uh, Gerald Myers did it better than Volkswagen did because the Rabbit had all kinds of issues in the beginning. Uh, but at the end of the day, the Rabbit is still thought of fondly today while this car is not. So, yeah, there it is. I like the way the antenna sort of goes into that cowl panel. I think that's kind of cool. Um, you know, otherwise up front, you really have nothing to differentiated from any more modern vehicle. They did have a computer-controlled transmission. This is the computer there. Uh, you had a computer-controlled engine. It was considered semi-revolutionary at the time, particularly the transmission part, because that was just something that wasn't happening. And uh, that was a way that it beat out some of the other companies. So anyway, that's under the hood. Everything looking pretty good. The front opening hood is kind of one of the only distinguishing features that really stands out in this car. Otherwise, it's just pure vanilla. Uh, I told you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the top up real quick so you can see that uh, because there is some interest to that part of it. So let me get this cover off it. All right, here you see it with the top up. It's like a Bentley now. You know, you got your four seat cabriolet. Uh, this is interesting. This little black strip, uh, which they put in to make the top of uh, the top. The top, the top not seem so sort of bulky and you know enormous. If that was saddle from the back to the front, it would look a lot more awkward than it does with the black um, insert. So you know, again, kind of a Dick Teague thing. Uh, you got a uh, plastic rear window which works fine. It's pretty clear in this thing, and uh, otherwise everything nice. So uh, very formal roof line and interesting to see again this Renault in convertible form when you're talking about something that was basically an economy car, you know, meant to get you from point A to point B in an extremely boring fashion. Uh, all of a sudden, now you can put the top down. And at the time, it was one of the most affordable, I think it was a thousand less than its closest competitor in terms of being a car that you could put the top down in. I think it, I, I had 10, 12 grand, which is probably like 20, 22 in today dollars. And uh, you had yourself a Renault Alliance convertible. So uh, all very snazzy. So I tell you what, I'm going to get my GoPro shit set up for the interior. And uh, I'm still trying that. And get my shit in the trunk. And then we're going to go for a drive and see what we got. So bear with me one moment. All right, I've got my GoPro set up and recording. So we'll see how those work. I can't promise they'll be in this video. But... Yeah, they might be if it turns out all right. I got a lot of flack in that GTO for holding this camera while using the GoPros, but, you know, I don't trust them. So that's why I still was using the camera is because, you know, for one, the audio seemed muffled and weird out of the GoPros, so I needed to have that. Uh, number two, it was the first time I used them, so who the hell knows? I couldn't count on it. I had to keep using the GoPro and, uh, or sorry, keep using the handheld camera, which is what I did, and I'm going to be doing the same today, so... Anyway, there's a little tailpipe. It looks like the generator tailpipe on my motorhome. It's just this tiny little thing. So let's have a look inside. Now, the convertible narrowed the back seat somewhat from the coupe and sedan form. So you're really not getting three Canadians back there. You're going to be lucky to get two. And frankly, they better be very good friends. So uh, one thing that was neat is that Renault ended up putting a single track on the seats, on the front seats, so that all of a sudden you had, look at all the foot room around the bottom of the front seat. And that was a big deal at the time because six foot passengers could put their, you know, giant feet underneath the bottom of the seat without having to spread it. I mean, you had a lot of room in the back seat. You also have an ashtray back there, which is nice. You've got another one at this side. So apparently the French were still smoking in 87 extensively and that's great and uh, of course two seat belts your rear speakers and uh, I'm kind of happy this one has window cranks instead of power windows because I have this feeling that they just didn't work well uh, there you can see my GoPro is set up when I move that seat forward it probably screwed it up a little bit so I'm going to try and get that back in line 
But anyway, there it is. It's set up and it's recording. It looks like it's aimed up now. Let me aim it back straight and we'll see what happens. I also have <laughs> the windshield aiming down. So this is an all new world for me. Uh, this interior was designed by Dick Teague, but he still had to use a lot of parts native to the Renault, which is why it's kind of weird. Uh, you've got very simple door panels with window cranks, nothing fancy about them. Uh, you've got sort of cloth and vinyl seats, which, you know, befit a, an entry level economy car, even if this one is in the more expensive convertible form. And, uh, you know, for a French car, it's not as bizarre and weird as it could be. And I do think we have to thank Dick Teague for that. But that said, it is a little bizarre and weird. And let's get in and find out why. So, all right, we're sitting down. We're going to fire this thing up. See, I found that you have to push that stick forward. I think the neutral safety switch is up towards the front. But anyway, nice little flare up there, and then that 1.7 fires to life. You see, we got our e-brake warning. Let me put that down. Out goes that. You've got a 100 mile an hour speedometer. You've got pretty good gauges. You've got a temp gauge, you got a volt gauge, you got your fuel gauge, uh, you got a tack. So, you know, the car is pretty well gauged out. I don't know if these are replacing. Obviously these are. These buttons here are all duds. So uh, obviously we could have had more fancy stuff and a more upscale model. Uh, you got a neat little place to put narcotics or a little bag of pot or coke up here uh, where you could grab it when you need it on the road. Uh, you got a remote mirror on this side. A remote mirror you have to lean over to the other side. You got another narcotic pocket over here and one out of eight runs the uh, hazard. So that's it. Who knows what those other buttons could have been. Uh, here's your air conditioning vents. You get down here a very similar. There, I'm hitting the wipers. And it's hitting the GoPro. Oh my god. Oh, stop. Come on, turn. Oh. Oh. Anyway, you've got your climate control here, which is quite simple. Uh, this does nothing. This obviously replaced something it could have had, as did this. Uh, you've got a uh, cigarette lighter here, which hasn't been used, so whoever owned this didn't smoke much. Uh, you got a little ashtray here. And then in this really hard to get to spot in front of the shifter, you've got your stereo. 15th anniversary with a 15th and of course, you get nothing but, um, you get nothing but ads this time of the morning, so let's see. I can't find uh, it's not fine. It has an antenna and it's still not finding any stay. Anyway, it's very rare that this one has the automatic. Quite a few of these at five. I guess it's not that rare. There were automatics out there, but it would have been better if it had the five speed because uh, the three speed automatic is actually quite boring uh, for uh, what it is. And how the hell do you even tune this if you can't do anything but seek? There's AM. I didn't program in any of the buttons, and this absolutely sucks. So we're not going to get any stereo out of it. The hell with it. Uh, down there is your e-brake. It's weird that you can put your finger underneath the shifter. I don't understand that at all. Uh, getting over here, you've got a little package where you can put crap. Uh, you got a glove box where we have our owner's manual and some loose parts. And a little Renault badge over there on the side, which could have been an AMC badge if things had worked out differently. Uh, up here, you've got your uh, sun visors with all kind of like stitchy, angular shit on it. You've got your interior light. You've got this one has a mirror that Dalton didn't bother to clean because he's Dalton. And uh, there we are uh, over on the steering column. And let me get my seatbelt on, then we'll get it. Oh, for God's sake. And all of this is weird. Let me. T First of all, I can't move the damn seatbelt. Oh my God. This piece of shit. I can, oh. Oh, it's like torture. Look at the length of these seatbelt stocks, and I can't reach it. Oh, there it is. <sighs> anyway, I've got my seatbelt on now. Weird how big and long those stocks are. The seatbelt seems to latch like halfway up your arms. What is this? Why is that open? Oh God, that probably came on. That was the, um, that doesn't matter. So there you've got your cluster. You've got this tote steering column moves up and down that's nice uh, these are your headlights which takes you forever to find if you're uninitiated your horn button 
there on the side of the stalk, which you're never going to find in an emergency. And uh, otherwise, you know, there it is. So, oh God, all right, let's go for a spin, get this thing over with. And I will say this, I get a little bit about the driving on this car, um, that it was smooth, that it was a little bit different from the competition at the time, um, that it was fuel injected, that it had a long wheelbase, that it had a bigger interior. You know, I get why some of the people out there who really don't care about having anything sporty or interesting might have bought this thing. Uh, but by the same token, it is boring. The car just goes down the road in a way that's... I don't know. I mean, you know, like it's power steering, which it probably doesn't need to be. And... It's fine. I mean, you've got a lot of body roll, but that's not uncommon for a French car because, you know, the French like a soft suspension. You look at any Citroen, it's what they do. And um, otherwise, it's just fine. I mean, the response is there. The brakes are decent. Not great, but decent. You know, everything sort of works as it should. And uh, that's about all you can do. <laughs> What can I say? I mean, the thing drives like a car. It just drives like a car. So look, let me pause it there, get out on the road, and then I'll pick it up again as I'm driving. Bear with me. All right, so look, going down the road, there's really not that much you can say. I mean, the thing's gonna get you where you're going. It's fine. Um, you got air conditioning, you got power steering, you got decent disc brakes. You got decent room inside, you got your lady friend with you, you know, you're going to drop her off later and then you're going to hit the Asian massage and they're not going to expect much of a tip out of you because you pulled up at a Renault Alliance. And uh, all is right in the world and I can sort of see why we got all kinds of smoke here, at least at the beginning. Uh, it sold fairly well because, you know, it did what it was supposed to do. But I can also see why when the competition started improving that the sales dropped off in a hurry because, first of all, the cars didn't hold together very well. Nobody predicted that because it felt like high quality at first. Uh, but um, secondly, you know, it just didn't work out. So in 87, Chrysler ended up buying AMC. They wanted it for Jeep. They didn't give a shit about Renault. They kept a couple of the Eagle models, but otherwise that was it. And uh, the Renault uh, Alliance very quickly was sent to the ash heap of history. And, you know, who could expect otherwise? And that's definitely not what was hoped for when the car was released. So anyway, this one is going to be at that premiere auction. Uh, thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will try to have some more fun stuff coming out later. In the meantime, I'll let these GoPros keep going and uh, we're going to see what they come up with. So thanks for having a look and we will see you with the next one. Take care.